I'm absolutely delighted to be here to speak to the forum today because I have been struggling for something like two decades trying to convey to my colleagues in English department the uh, real import of the digital shift. And in fact, that's the subject of my latest book. So I'll be delighted to share those thoughts with you today. And right now I'll just go to uh, my PowerPoint. So it, it may seem strange that I say that I was uh, struggling to convey this, but <clears throat> to my colleagues in English departments, often it seems as though nothing has changed because they had print books before the advent of the computer era and they have print books now. So what's the big deal? So we can illustrate that here by looking at uh, two versions of Faulkner's sound and theory. And on the left screen, we see a very pricey first edition of the hardback. Uh, this, was, this was undoubtedly produced with movable type. I doubt if even a, um, even a rotary printer was used uh, because it has that early 20th century date. On the left, we see a very recent edition. In all likelihood, if you ordered this edition from Amazon, it would be printed using CreateSpace from the files that they already have and delivered to you the next day. So that's the question. What is the difference between these two versions of this text? Besides the price, of course. Uh, well, as librarians, you know very well that you would shelve the first edition in your rare book room in all likelihood. The other would be on the stack. But the difference that I'm especially interested in here today is not that difference. It's the difference in how the artifact was produced. So my colleagues who think nothing much has changed uh, about books are thinking of the books as an isolated object. But archeologists know that if you wanna really understand an artifact, you have to consider the artifact in its context. So until about 1950, uh, there were important innovations in print technology uh, color lithography, for example, uh, but it wasn't until about the 1950s that computation really began to be an important point. And so I refer to print as all those books produced from Gutenberg up until mid 20th century. And I use the term post print to indicate books produced after about 2000 when computational media had penetrated by that point into almost every aspect of the book trade. So I approach the idea of postprint through another uh, idea that I had been developing through a series of books most recently in my book called Unthought, and that is the idea of cognitive assemblages. Uh, and which I define as collectivities through which information, interpretation, and meaning circulate. And these uh, cognitive assemblages can include humans, they can inc include non-human life forms, for example, bacteria, and they can include computational media. And in a lar larger argument I won't have time to make here, uh, I argue that all of these entities have cognitive capabilities, that all non-human life forms have cognitive capabilities, humans of course do as well, and also cognitive media, uh, computational media. So another claim I make is that most of the world's work now in developed societies is done through cognitive assemblages. And that's because computational media have penetrated deeply into the infrastructures of developed societies because they are the controllers, disseminators, and modulators of information. So previously, um, 
Previously, electromechanical systems now almost all have cognitive uh, computational media as controllers embedded within them. And it's these computational media that really control how the work is done. So in my view, cognitive assemblages have two faces like Janus. One of the faces of a cognitive assemblage faces toward information flows. And here the emphasis is on uh, the kind of data, the, how fast the data is moving, the conduits through which it's moving and so forth. But the other side faces toward embodied and material entities. So in order to produce an information flow, there has to be some material entity. It could be a machine, it could be a life form, it could be a human, but there has to be some embodied entity to create that information flow in the first place. So <clears throat> if we consider a, a cognitive assemblage in terms of a book, uh, if we take an ordinary book, uh, what else is included to activate that book? Well, of course, there's the human reader, but <clears throat> every book that's published now, except for a very few done with uh, fine art presses, also has a computational reader. The book exists in its material form as an artifact, but it also exists as computer files. And in addition to the readers of the computer and the human, there are also all the readers at the press, some human, some computational, that are doing the design, the editing, and the production of the book. And then in addition to that, there's all the warehousing, storage, sales, display, advertising, and so forth, all of which is likely involves some degree of computational media. So in producing this book, uh, I wanted to play on some of the material qualities of the book to emphasize that uh, all of these marks on the page are what Dennis Tennant calls <clears throat> laminate signifiers. That is, they appear as fixed immovable marks uh, once they're printed, but every one of those marks has computational code underlying it in the code files associated with the book. So my idea was <clears throat> to create a few pages in the book that would act like x-rays. That is, they would draw the reader's attention to the underlying code. So there would be a passage on say the left-hand page, which would be in bold type. And then on the right-hand page would be the computer codes corresponding to that passage that uh, made it be able to be printed. Well, this proved to be more difficult than I had anticipated in the abstract. And I was working with the press designer who was a, a great designer, but not very, uh, not very, conversant in computer codes. So in many cases, we had to, uh, I had to compromise a bit on what I had in mind. But I did finally get 10 x-ray pages included in the book. And <clears throat> each of those pages had to be hand designed to make the content flow come out right. So here's an example of one of the x-ray pages. This is kind of a cheat because it's not the binary code for, say, a paragraph on the facing page that would have been way, way too long to include. So uh, we compromised by just including the binary code for a single sentence. A computer manipulates binary codes of ones and zeros. And then uh, facing the binary code is a table correlating the binary code with the ASCII symbols. So that's an example of uh, what counts as an x-ray page in this book. Here's another example where uh, on the left side, you see a bolded passage, and then on the right side, you see the HTML coding for that passage. Uh, so besides the trying to reify the uh, does the idea of the laminate signifier through design. I also wanted to talk about 
uh, the technologies that were gradually being interpenetrated by computational media. And of course, it's somewhat arbitrary how you date this, but I started with the page compositor, uh, which was invented in the 1880s by James Page and had as its most famous investor, Mark Twain. And Page's mistake was to try to duplicate with the compositor all the motions that a human compositor would do. And this made the machine so cumbersome that it could never be made commercially successful. It was used by a newspaper for two months, broke down repeatedly. Page was the only one who knew enough to, to repair it. And so finally they gave up and thereafter it, it was never used. There is only one still extant, which is at the Mark Twain Museum in Connecticut. Uh, Cornell University had one, but it, during World War II, it donated it to be used for scrap iron in the war effort. So now there's only one. The next uh, important event that I trace in the technology producing books was the Lumatype prototype setter. And this was produced by um, Moirod and Higanot in 1947. They succeeded in attracting some funding and it fundamentally altered the way that typesetting was done because as it's the first book proclaims that was produced by it, which was The Wonderful Life of Insects. Um, it has a special page inserted at the end pointing out that this is the first book ever produced that did not use metal type pieces. And that extra page at the end confidently predicts this is going to be the wave of the future. The next nodal point I touch on is um, the fiber optic cable that uh, was used in computer assisted typesetter. It was not a great success commercially in typesetting, but it really transformed how information was conveyed from one point to the other. The next one is the Xerox DocuTech. This was the machine uh, first launched in 1990 that uh, used a fully computerized uh, set of software to produce the uh, book copies. And uh, it really was the machine that made books on demand possible. And then I conclude with the Amazon Kindle and the Mac iPad as examples of ebook readers. So in addition to a chapter tracing the technology of uh, typesetting and printing and the way that computational media interpenetrated that process, I also uh, made a visit to five university presses to try to determine how presses were dealing with this shift to computational media. And you can see there on the screen, the five presses I visited. These are all presses with which I had some form of relationship. So I felt emboldened to uh, take up some of their time in, in interviewing them. And I talked to both the, direct, the directors at each of these presses and also uh, staff members. And um, it was clear that there were significant changes in the process of editing and design. For, for example, the use of computational templates in the design for a book. It was also very clear that there, was, there were considerable changes in sales and distribution, especially with Amazon as their biggest customer. It made a huge difference in how they had to manage their workflow. But throughout, for each of these five presses, it was also clear to me that the cultural authority of the book remains. And many of the, the heroes, unsung heroes at these presses who are dedicated to bringing the best of scholarship uh, to the world, uh, still have as their primary image of what, what it is they're doing, the book, the print book. As one of my interlocutors sell, said, we sell books, we market formats. Well, of course the print book 
is a format. But for this person, the idea of the book, the idea of the book, we might even call it the ideology of the book, is what was primary. So everywhere um, I went at these five presses, people talked about the precarity of their situation in trying to produce scholarly monographs. So to just run through the figures for a typical case, and of course it's difficult to generalize because the production cost depends on length, on whether it has images and so on and so forth. But in a typical case, it costs about $25,000 to produce a typical monograph. And if we assume a list price and of $60 and a net of $42, this means the press has to sell 600 copies of a print book in order to make back their costs. But increasingly, the sales of scholarly monographs are decreasing. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, it was typical for a well-reviewed book to sell 2,500 to 3,000 copies. Now, even if a book is regarded as important and is well-reviewed, the press is lucky to sell as few as 400 copies. That means that for every book they produce, they're running a deficit, typically, of about $8,000. And if they are sold through Amazon rather than the press's website, the net is even lower because Amazon takes half. So clearly, this is not a sustainable business model. And how are the presses coping? Well, each is coping in a slightly different way. Columbia, for example, uh, Jennifer Crew, the director of Columbia, puts a great deal of emphasis on what she calls the right mix. So what she means by that is that every once in a while, one of the books that the press publishes will sell far, far more copies than is typical. And that, uh, that high selling book can carry along several other low selling books and still make it come out even. In Chicago, which is the largest of these university presses, they have their distribution center where uh, which serves to dis distribute uh, for about 100 other presses. And they make considerable profits from their distribution center, which allows them to carry on. Duke University <clears throat> has taken yet another task. Uh, Steve Kahn, the director there, told me straight out, we don't publish monographs. And when we do, it's a failure. And I asked him to define, what do you mean by a monograph? And he defined it exactly as I would, a, a scholarly book aimed at specialists that uh, doesn't have much classroom adoption potential. Minnesota is perhaps the most adventuresome of these five presses. It's um, using its profits elsewhere in its um, sales portfolio to bankroll what they call the Manifold Project. The Manifold Project is an adventuresome project that takes a print book and uh, networks it. So the, the book is available in print just as it ordinarily would, but it's accompanied by a web project that will include a lot of material that the print book can't. Uh, so that's a, a, a kind of an all-in sort of approach. Um, they don't expect to make money out of the Manifold Project, but what they do expect to do is to use the scholarly resources of the web to enhance scholarship and enrich the final product so that it's much more useful for researchers than if it were the print book alone. And then at California, there's the Luminos Project. So the Luminos Project in brief uh, has as its strategy, uh, displacing the cost of producing the book from the press onto the writer. So for their books, they require at least a $7,500 subvention from the author and or the author's institution. So this immediately sets up a problematic um, 
distinction between scholars who come from well-financed institutions who can afford this kind of subvention and scholars who come from uh, more modest institutions that cannot afford this subvention. And they've developed various strategies to compensate for this, like having a fund for those authors and so forth. They also make all of their books uh, available free on the web. So that's the payoff. The author contributes to the cost of producing the book, but the book is put on the web and is, and is available to anyone anywhere in the world free of cost. So their view is that this really uh, stimulates the uptake of scholarship, especially in the global South. So they're seeing a lot of uptake in Vietnam, for example, in Brazil, in Korea. All of the books in the Luminos project that are available for free on the web can also be purchased as books on demand, print on demand. But when a print on demand book is, uh, is sold, the profits from that print on demand book do not go back to the author. They go into the Luminos project to further fund uh, the, uh, the cost of producing the book. So um, the Luminos project has its defenders. Uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, for example, is on the board and she's also an ardent defender of open access publishing. But uh, if we look at the true cost of publishing a monograph, it's interesting to look at the uh, Ithaca S plus R report on this. So uh, Ithaca S plus R got a, Mellon grant to determine what was the actual cost of producing a monograph. And they convened a panel of experts and the experts were asked to consider both direct and indirect presses. They contacted 20 university presses and got figures for all of the direct and indirect costs that go into publishing. And <clears throat> their totals ranged from a low of 15,000 per book to a high of 129,000. So if we take a midpoint of say 35,000 to produce a book, then um, it's questionable whether the Luminos project could continue uh, because the true costs of producing the book are gonna be much more than that, uh, than that 75, in fact, they would need to absorb about $27,000 for every book. And publishing more books doesn't solve this problem. It only makes it worse because the more books they publish, the greater the deficit. And they also face a problem that if they're offering a deal to writers, okay, you give us $7,500, we'll put your book on the web for free. I mean, free to readers. Um, other companies, uh, perhaps less scrupulous, can compete saying, well, we'll put your book on the web for only $5,000. So that initiates what Alan Thomas at Chicago calls the race to the bottom, where now the economics take uh, first priority, not the quality. Oh, and I should add that all of the books that are in the Luminos project go through exactly the same peer review rigorous uh, screening that all their print books do. So um, now having sort of raced through the economics of book publishing, uh, we might ask, uh, I've talked about the, the laminate signifier, uh, the way that computational media are affected uh, production processes and so forth, but how does it appear in the content? So I have a chapter about this topic where I compare two very different cases. The first case is a book by Amaranth Borsak and Brad Bose called Between Page and Screen. This is a very innovative book because it has no words in it. It only only has icons that only the computer can read. So you initialize your computer at their website, and then you 
hold the book uh, page of the book up so that it can be seen by the webcam on your computer. And then in the space sort of between you and the computer, the words are projected. And you can see that in the image there with Amaranth holding the book and seeing the text appear. And this allows all kinds of uh, very innovative effects. So it's a book that can only be read by a computer. But unfortunately, this book is programmed in Flash. And you see in one of the x-ray pages a little Flash code at the bottom. And as you probably know, Flash uh, was no longer supported at the end of uh, 2020. So many works, including this book, are now unplayable, which is one of the primary obstacles to creating electronic literature, problem of obsolescence. And here you see the book being held up to the webcam and then the image being created. This actually is a little animation, so it's quite, uh, quite innovative on what a print book can do. The contrasting case is a, um, it's a few pages from Mirtha Dermasash's uh, acemic writing. So acemic writing can be thought of as mark making, but mark making that never resolves into alphabetic symbols. So it, it um, I'm careful to say that it's not marks without significance because the whole idea of acemic writing is that this kind of writing in fact can have significance. It has its own rhythm. It has its own progression of forms as you can see in the page there. And Mirtha Dermasash uh, died in 2012. She was from Argentina. So I was fortunate to be able to get permission from her state to reproduce a few pages from her book of acemic writing. So uh, that is, concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Here's my um, email and website. Don't visit the website right away because it's being revised as we speak. and <laughs> It'll be ready next week. In any event, uh, thank you very much. And I welcome all of your thoughts and uh, questions and comments on this. Uh, so excuse me yeah thank you okay that's a really interesting and stimulating um, presentation um i've been thinking about some of the issues that you've uh you 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 addressed and i mean one of the things that struck me is that um whether or not well the question of whether or not the technology shift has really shifted the type of books scholarly books in particular that are being published i mean you've given us a couple of examples there and in fact in your own book you gave us the example of these of the x-ray pages but it strikes me and maybe it's because of the the the, the, the fear of 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 the technology shifting but it strikes me that they're very rare in terms of um you know the the, the typical scholarly monograph is pretty much as it has been for decades now, and I, I wonder if you're seeing a, a beginning of a shift in terms of the, the sorts of books people are writing, or is it still very much in that traditional mode? Well, what I see is uh, a movement toward a kind of dual track, especially among other younger scholars. So the, the idea is to produce the traditional scholarly monograph to make sure you have your bona fides in that area established for when you apply for tenure, but at the same time to establish a website or a series of websites, a very well-researched blog. And often the website or in particular the blogs have a more public facing dimension than a scholarly book does. So they're written for larger audiences and compared to scholarly books, the influence of a website can be massive. So, you know, we, we, we have this that uh, maybe 400 copies of a scholarly book are read and okay, let's say people may check it out from a library. So you can't just rely on sales, but it's likely that scholarly monographs may only have on the order of a thousand or 2000 readers. But if you have a well-constructed website, you're talking about reaching people in the thousands 
or even the hundreds of thousands. So I think here as an example of Todd Pressner's uh, Hypercities website, which was developed to reach out to people worldwide where they had a platform where they could incorporate local information about their particular neighborhood, their city, their town, and uh, all of the facilities were there that made it easy to do and to connect that with people all over the world. So HyperCities has something like 100 to 200,000 users. So it, it really raises the question for tenure committees, how do you weight influence versus quality? So of course, there are also ways uh, that are now codified by the MLA of how you determine the quality of a website. But this is a slightly different issue. It's, you know, how do you rate a first rate scholarly book that reaches a thousand people compared to a website that reaches a hundred thousand? So I think tenure committees across the country are wrestling with questions exactly like this. And people at the presses, university presses are very much aware that uh, for many institutions, the scholarly press monograph remains the gold standard in the humanities. And they feel that as a burden upon themselves, you know, they, they say, we don't want to determine people's tenure. That's not our business. Our business is just to, to publish first grade scholarship. So they don't want to see institutions offload tenure decisions on whether or not they have a university press monograph. But still, it's a strange situation where uh, if, someone has a scholarly monograph and there's a competitor who has a really well done website in the same department and the department's decided only one of these two people is gonna get tenure. Uh, how, do they, how do they evaluate the worth of the value of those two very different kinds of projects? So one of the, one of the good things I think about this dual track approach that I see many younger scholars take is that it's also broadening the rhetoric of scholarship. So it's uh, creating more of a public, more of a public for general scholarship than certainly was the case during the 1980s and 1990s when deconstruction made uh, literary books anyway, incomprehensible to the general public. So I think it's a very good thing that younger scholars are thinking about how to make their issues relevant to a larger audience. I think that can ultimately only be good for scholarship and for uh, the whole enterprise of scholarship in general. Um, so uh, within the questions, and there's a there's a couple of points picking up exactly on that. So uh, Brian Alexander has has um, picked up on that in terms of um, um, web content, which is a supplement to the monograph, and he's got a couple of examples that I wasn't aware of. But um, um, uh, Juan Cole's blogging um, about his book on Napoleon in Egypt, or uh, uh, another one from Nathan Grawls. Um, posting data sets and visualizations um, on uh, to go to go with a book on the demographics of uh, higher education. So I guess that's a sort of a mixed model, isn't it? You've got the monograph, the traditional monograph, but then you've got this uh, additional information and materials available uh, online. Well, um, I'm very familiar with that model because I did exactly that with my book called uh, How We Think. I created a companion website um, that had uh, part, a chapter in the print book was on telegraph code books. Uh, the website included a database of 150 telegraph code books that could be searched in a number of different ways. It included all the uh, audio of interviews I did uh, in conjunction with that book. And uh, now we come to the problem of obsolescence. Well, there's two problems with this approach. Uh, first is obsolescence. So the databases that I included in, in that companion to my book, the web companion, 
were coded with a, a special form of SQL that is not now supported by most uh, web portals. And so I was hosting it at one web portal and they told me that they couldn't continue because uh, they didn't, the, their new platform did not um, interface with that, with that particular coding. So those databases now are inoperative. The second problem with that approach is that when you create a digital companion, you, you're now creating one website amongst millions or hundreds of millions on the web. And so it's very difficult for people to find it unless they happen to read your book. And then you say in your book, well, there's this companion website. But that's the argument that Doug Armato uses for the Manifold Project that instead of trying to create your own little website to go along with your book, included in Manifold, then you have a whole big set of websites uh, that serve exactly this purpose, but now have a much larger web presence than any one individual website could have. And so that sort of leads very neatly into a, a question that uh, Adnan uh, Audi has, has has asked about um, what you know does does the library community have a responsibility here in terms of of preserving that material? Um, is that something that we should be we should be doing? I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but is that something that we should be doing? Is that is that our responsibility? Is that somebody you know that the you know and and then how you how you then address the example that you gave around flash um you know and then the flash content as well that's uh, that's only readable if you if you have access to that so how much of a role you know for the traditional you know if you see the library as being the, the traditional um preservation mechanism for a lot of this material is this something that we should be moving into as a, as a community well the more you work with digital media the more you come to appreciate the uh, the truth that the archival medium par excellence is print. That, you know, you can go back uh, to a first edition of Principia Mathematica published in uh, the 15th century, open it up and the pages are just as pristine as they were when it was first published. What is the lifetime of digital media? Well, Flash is a perfect example. Flash, <clears throat> Flash was here for maybe 20 years, and uh, the field of electronic literature flourished on all these Flash works that were created, and all of those works are now obsolete, and they have to be reprogrammed in order to be playable. So in my view, it's really not practical for libraries to get into the idea of archiving electronic material and unless they want to do that for a special collection sort of way. So I mentioned the field of electronic literature and Dini Gregar at Washington State University of Vancouver has launched a massive archival project to recover those lost works of electronic literature. So what does that entail? Well, it entails uh, keeping the old machines running. So you have the old machines, that, so you can see the work as they were originally intended on an Apple, early Apple computer, for example. It entails emulating a lot of those works on modern computers, and it entails uh, reprogramming, reprogramming them so you can get some sort of equivalent in a different kind of program. And just to list this shows you what a massive enterprise that is. And I can see that a library might choose this to do, to do this for some small collection. I don't think it's going to be feasible on a massive scale just because it's so labor intensive and money intensive. Yes, the idea of of say all of our members uh, within our UK providing that type of service seems quite um, uh, it, it, it seems difficult to envisage um, that happening, and um, it, it seems as if there will be some perhaps some centres of expertise 
on this that um, are, are able to, to to manage that process as as you described, um, but but it, it seems unlikely that it would um, be wider than that. Um, I wanted to turn, if, if if I could, to some of the issues around uh, university presses and and costs. Um, so there's been um, some questions about um, whether or not um, the the shift to digital has has pushed a lot of the work or more of the work onto the author so you know in the old days as you said you know there, there would have been typesetting taking place within a printers that doesn't happen now a lot of formatting is done by the author as they're writing the the, the, the book does that bring costs down in terms of producing monographs so you know there's a lot some of the labor is being shifted over towards the creator well um this is a multi-pronged problem uh and it, it the short answer is to produce a really good book takes money and it's not only production money but it's money in editing so uh, i think of alan thomas an editor at the university of chicago press who uh, is a wonderful editor he's been my editor for for 20 years but in each project he takes on, he wants to work with the author to improve the book. So he doesn't see his business as just copy editing an already finished manuscript. He sees his business as seeing an early draft, giving suggestions, putting, you know, uh, giving ideas, and then working with the author as the book becomes stronger and a better book. So that kind of expertise is very expensive because each individual project takes a considerable amount of time. So if the press has that idea of itself, that it really wants to work with authors to help them realize their ideas in the most finished and the most powerful form, there's no way you can do cost cutting on a process like that. It just is what it is. And that is the Chicago commitment. Uh, but even Alan Thomas is not sure how long into the future they can continue that kind of intensive work on books. And then I, I mentioned the x-ray pages. Well, it maybe took the designer an extra month to be able to produce those pages in my book. So you, you, that has a cost. Yeah. If you take your top designer and now you commit your top designer for a month to do this project, well, it ups the cost of the book considerably. So uh, it is true that authors are taking on more of the, the uh, minutia of copy editing and so forth themselves. But uh, when you work with a really talented designer, they frequently have ideas that won't occur to an author. Just as an example, in my book, Unthought, uh, Matt Avery, the designer at Chicago, had the idea of taking some of the large capital letters uh, in chapter headings and so forth and making the font thin as it went down the page, which was an inspired idea that perfectly captured the spirit of the book. I would never have thought of that. And of course, that takes extra time as well. You can't do that with a template. It, it's a you know a bespoke design. So, um, so I think, yes, some of this can be pushed off of the authors, not only in terms of time, but in terms of money as the Luminos project is doing. But good book designers and dedicated editor, editors at major presses fulfill roles that I don't think authors can do, at least I can't do. Yeah, yeah. I think that that, that um, issue about how much work the author is doing um, is reflected in, in one of the comments, uh, I think uh, Rachel saying about if there's an expectation that authors should do more, um, either in terms of formatting uh, the actual monograph or in terms of producing additional material, um, if, if that leads to disadvantaging those who perhaps have less time um, because of you know other commitments, um, heavy teaching loads, disabilities, etc. Et so, are we you know the potentially creating a, a two tier system where the people who have time are able to produce these beautifully uh, curated 
uh, websites and, and the people who don't are you know are losing out because they, they, they don't have that time and and, and resource of, uh, yeah that that's true and and uh, I mentioned the manifold project at University of Minnesota press and uh, Doug Armato is quite upfront in saying that if an author agrees to have his or her book put in the manifold project it is a huge investment of time for them to gather the extra material, all that has to be curated and vetted, uh, formatted in a way that make it make ties it in with the print book and so forth. So that's absolutely true. And saying that you have the time amounts to saying that you come from a well-resourced institution, yeah. that you're not teaching at a community college, or you may not even be teaching at a state college. You're teaching in a major university that can allow those kinds of resources to be made available to you. I, I, I was thinking about some of the, the issues around business models as, as we're still on university presses and um, the California model uh, when, when describing reaching a, a wider geographical audience uh, reflects some of the open access presses that, that we have in the UK and some of their experiences. But I think I was struck as, as I think some others were by, by the, the quote from Duke about, um, about a failure. Um, um, uh, and that idea that university presses are seen as um, profit centers by their institutions, uh, you know, and should be making money in a way that libraries aren't, you know, libraries aren't expected to make money, libraries are a cost center for their institution, but they seem to be providing a service. And I wonder if, you know, and, and I, I, I do wonder if we have to rethink what a university press is for and what it's, what, how, how we define success in terms of university presses. Yes, every single press I talked with <clears throat> was feeling exactly that kind of economic pressure, even those that come from very prestigious universities like Columbia or Chicago. And <clears throat> they, they were playing a game of, uh, you know, uh, paying Peter from Paul sort of thing that they did have parts of the press that made money. For example, business publishing is frequently profitable. Journal publishing, especially in some fields, is particularly profitable. So they were shuttling their profits from, say, business publishing over to the humanities and to the fields that rely on monographs. But everyone I spoke with felt that this was uh, precarious, that it was not clear how much longer their institutions would uh, permit them to just break even. I mean, they weren't even talking about going in the red. Many of these presses were breaking even, but if their institution was demanding that they make money for them, then that put a addi whole additional pressure on, uh, which is a different situation than avoiding going into debt. You know, if you're breaking even, it looks like it's well that's okay but still the universities wanted to see increasingly the presses actually making money and contributing to the bottom line yeah. and that that is really really hard for them yeah i think that um uh, perhaps some university leaderships have been um um uh, have have been seduced by one or two exceptionally large university presses who make significant surpluses and feedback into the institutions. I'm thinking of two within the UK uh, who happen to be members of our UK who have very successful university presses who are, you know, who, who, who contribute to, to, to the running of the university. But that's, by, you know, that is so exceptional. And it's hard to see how that's a model for, um, for, for university presses uh, uh, at all. Um, we're running out of time and we've got some, I do have some more questions. I, there's one very technical question from right from the beginning, which I think you've sort of answered, but when you're talking about the X-ray pages and the underlying code, were you, were you specifically meaning sort of Unicode or were you talking about code in a, in a more generalized sense? Yeah, I was talking about code in a more generalized sense. Brilliant. Um, a question here about um, whether authors have a different expectation of the longevity of their work if they're going into print or, or digital. Do you think if someone produces 
is there any evidence that you know people are thinking well i'm, I'm going to produce some a website or whatever but i know it's only going to be there for for 10 years whereas i'm expecting the monograph the print monograph to be on the shelves of the libraries for the next 500 years or, or have we not got to that stage of thinking well this is already a, a quite uh, distinct uh, difference in how people think of their scholarly work. So for scholars who work primarily in print, they envision their books as uh, the culmination of a project. You embark on a project, you spend however many years on it, you publish your book, project finished. And you might make some connections with the next project, but generally speaking, uh, the book is, the book marks its finish. Whereas with a website, it's not an entirely different model. It's not on the model of book, book, book. It's a continuing process of updating the software, of expanding the website, trying to attract new users to it. So it's a continuous flow, not a kind of nodal flow, book, book, book. It's more website, website continuing, website still continuing. So it it's a, presents a, diff, a different vision of what it means to engage in scholarship. And there are a few scholars that do both of these models simultaneously, uh, but I think in general, one tends to specialize either in book production or in website production, and they result in really different career patterns. I think that, that sort of that that um, that twin track approach is 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 as I think we've sort of highlighted is a challenge to the library community as well. I mean, in what in terms in terms of what it means in, of preserving scholarship for the for for the long term, um, and one that we um, need to need, need to tackle. And I think you've given us some superb pointers in that.